Coming up on Quest, a landmark new effort in the fight to save California's endangered condors. A space mission reveals billions of planets like Earth. Other intelligent life in the universe is perhaps our greatest question. A groundbreaking discovery about how sleep washes toxins from our brains. And a dive into the ocean's twilight zone. Next on Quest. Support for Quest is provided by the National Science Foundation, the David B. Gold Foundation, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Capsonel Foundation, the Vedez Family Foundation, George G. and Jeanette A. Stewart Charitable Trust, and the members of KQED. Quest is a project of KQED Science. Condors carry the power of the wind. They also carry the honor and the power of the people. The power of the condor was legendary to the native people of California. This sacred bird, they believed, cleaned the land and carried spirits on its wings. For Matty Waya, a ceremonial leader and dolphin dancer of the Chumash tribe, the battle to save the California condor is a sacred duty. His organization, called the Wish Toyo Foundation, has joined the fight to bring the legendary Thunderbird back from the brink of extinction. When you think of the condor and how it's been here as long as the Shumish people, you know, we, we think of how us as modern day Shumish people need to re-identify ourselves. So to see the condor soar again, it gives us hope. For many California Bay Area tribes, the condor is a symbol of creation and healing. Now it's up to humanity to heal the condor. Biologist Kelly Sorensen and the field team from the Ventana Wildlife Society are out to perform a checkup on a captured condor. Today we have a nearly 10-year-old male California condor that was trapped a few days ago so that we could take a blood sample and determine if uh, there's any lead in the blood of that bird. This x-ray of a deer shot by a bullet reveals lead fragments visible as tiny black specks from the bullet slug. Condors are obligate scavengers, so they're, they're not out there killing anything. They're only eating the remains of dead animals. When an animal is shot with a, a lead bullet, oftentimes those fragments will be left behind in those carcasses. So when these scavengers eat carcasses shot with lead bullets, they can get poisoned. California condors once scavenged over a range that stretched from Canada to Mexico. But decades of hunting after the gold rush and loss of wild habitat drove the birds nearly to extinction. We've now come to realize that lead poisoning has also played a significant role in the decline of the species. By the 1980s, even though hunting condors had been banned, only 22 condors survived and just nine of those remained in the wild. It was then that federal biologists made the critical decision to capture the last free condors. Captive breeding programs have produced more than 420 condors in California, Utah, Arizona, and other parts of the West. But since 1992, more than 50 wild condors have died from lead poisoning. At that rate, without help, scientists say the species will never recover. We have a field crew that works incredibly hard all year round to constantly monitor birds. And the other big component of what they do is to try to trap every individual at least once a year, just so that we can determine if they're suffering from lead poisoning. To treat a condor with lead poisoning requires an aggressive medical process called chelation. So when lead enters the bloodstream, 
it blocks neurological receptors that control the digestive system. So literally what happens is the bird starves to death because it doesn't know that it's hungry. Chelation grabs a hold of that lead and then allows the animal to excrete it out naturally. We now know through scientific testing that the isotopes that are found in lead ammunition are the same isotopes found in the condor's blood. So now let's move from that and work on a solution. Former California Assemblyman Pedro Nava wrote a bill that became law in 2007. It banned the use of lead ammunition in the condor's main habitat from roughly Monterey to Ventura County. Today, the bird's range is expanding, with sightings of condors in Bay Area counties like Alameda, Santa Clara, and San Mateo. Condor populations also exist in Baja, Arizona, and southern Utah, where in 2014, the state's first condor chick hatched in the wild. But condors are still dying from lead poisoning. As a result, Governor Jerry Brown signed a new law in 2013 supported by environmental groups that bans the use of lead bullets for hunting everywhere in California. But some hunters, such as Bill Gaines of Sacramento, oppose the ban and see it as a burden to a community that provides an important source of funding for wildlife conservation. Revenue generated by the sale of hunting licenses, stamps, tags, and the various other permits, that generates $20 million last year to the state of California alone for wildlife-related habitat. If hunting goes away, we're going to lose that. Requiring non-lead bullets in the state of California is going to put an unnecessary hardship on California's hunters. It's going to drive the price of ammunition right through the roof. Many within the hunting community won't be able to afford that. Bullets made with copper and other non-toxic metals are generally more expensive than lead ammunition, and they may also be harder to come by, Gaines says. Today I'm shooting my 30 odd 6 which is arguably the most common caliber for big game. And as a result, it's the one that most likely has the non-toxic loads available. I had to pay about twice the price for them, but I had to call around to find where they were and I could pick them up. To give manufacturers time to scale up the production of non-toxic hunting ammunition, the California Fish and Game Commission has until 2019 to enforce the lead bullet ban. But Gaines wonders if this statewide ban will actually keep lead out of condors. There's no question that lead is poisoning California condors. The jury is still out, we believe, on just what the source of that lead is. There's no lead ammunition being shot in the California condor range, but the condors are still showing up with lead poisoning. Lead poisoning is the leading cause of death for condors. And for scientists like Kelly Sorensen, the source of this lead is clear. We've found uh, evidence of fragments from rifle slugs in the digestive system of condors. 2.7. So low lead means good news and we can let this guy free. One, two. Condor cams at the Ventana Wildlife Society Sanctuary in Big Sur and the San Diego Zoo provide a window online for the public to see how these critically endangered birds live in the wild and in captivity. We want the condors to, to be the way they were once before and, and flying on their own, breeding on their own. We honor the spirits of those that have left this world, including the condor. These mountains and hills are still shaped the same way as they were 10,000 years ago. And just like their ancestors, they'll find their way. It's an amazing feeling. You're going through and it's dark and all of a sudden I can see fish and then I can see this mountain. And I have no doubt that I was one of the first people ever to see that space. I'm Bart Shepard. I'm director of Steinart Aquarium at the California Academy of Sciences. We have this great stage where we bring people in and we showcase the biodiversity and the wonderful things that are found on, on our planet. A big part of my job is the care and the feeding and the management of the living collection here at the Academy. But another really exciting part of my job is exploration diving. The Philippines is a special place. This latest expedition was really to document the biodiversity in an area that's known as the Verde Island Passage. 
It seems to be the place that has more species in the ocean than anywhere else on Earth. This was a huge expedition. I think we topped out at nearly 70 participants, and not all of those are academy scientists. We also had Filipino professors, collaborators, students, educators, a wide range of people representing different functions and different disciplines. One of the things that made this trip different and more exciting was that we were doing exploration in what we call the twilight zone, or mesophotic coral reefs, which are found typically below the depths that you would normally see recreational scuba diving. Anywhere from 250 to say 500 feet. So this area has been largely unexplored. About half of what we see is unknown to science. In order to reach these areas, we're using a technology that's known as closed circuit rebreathers. We also breathe very specialized gas, so we're diving with Trimix, which is a mix of oxygen, nitrogen, and helium, so that you don't get the narcosis. We're really breathing uh, something that's on the order of about 70% helium. Uh, so the really fun part about that is the helium voice when you're talking to each other at 300 feet. Hello. It's really exciting for me to be a part of one of these teams that's starting to do some of this exploration and at a time when it's so critical understanding what's going on with the health of our oceans. Sleep. Shakespeare called it nature's soft nurse. It draws us into its embrace, at once familiar and elusive. Sleep is really one of the last great scientific mysteries. We're really at a, a revolutionary stage in science where we have some wonderful technologies to help us perhaps for the first time understand the functions of sleep. Sleep seems to be present in every animal organism that we've studied to date. And the fact that it is so common across all species tells us it must be critically important, that it must be necessary at the most basic biological levels. Our need for sleep is regulated by a circadian or daily master clock that causes us to feel more awake during the day and sleepy at night. Humans are the only species that will intentionally fight the urge to sleep usually to meet the demands of our fast-paced lives. I can't operate without coffee. I wish I actually could sleep more, but I basically work a lot. And I know when I don't get enough, I'm really crabby the next day. But how much does our mood really suffer when we don't slumber? This question keeps some people up at night, like Matt Walker and his students. So we deprive people of a night of sleep, or we gave them a full night of sleep, and then we place them inside the MRI scanner and we showed them increasingly negative and unpleasant emotional images. The sleep-deprived subject showed wildly exaggerated activity in the amygdala, the brain's emotional center. Without sleep, it's as though you're all emotional gas pedal and no brake. And we think this may explain why there's such a strong relationship between emotional problems in psychiatric disorders that have sleep problems associated with them. To grasp the complex functions of sleep, it helps to understand the dynamic journey your sleeping brain takes through the night. We have rapid eye movement sleep, or REM sleep, the principal stage from which we dream. On the other hand, we have non-rapid eye movement sleep. Non-REM sleep is subdivided into four stages, from the lighter stages to the deep restorative stages. These two types of sleep will essentially play out in a battle for brain domination throughout the night. And what that creates is what we call a sleep cycle. By tracking changes in electrical activity, scientists have found connections between sleep and neurological activities like memory. Walker and his team think they may have discovered the mechanism by which the brain creates lasting memories during sleep. It's almost as though your learning system is like a USB stick. And during the day, we're acquiring lots of information rapidly. We think that sleep is a time where those files that are lodged in the USB stick in the hippocampus 
are actually exported out to the hard drive of our brain, which is a structure called the cortex. Those files are now safer in this large storage space of the cortex. But the second benefit is that when we wake up the next day, our USB stick has now been cleared out. So we can start to learn new information anew. The sleeping brain also filters information as it stores it, allowing us to forget as well as to remember. A lack of sleep also affects our physical health, contributing to weight gain and impairing the immune system. Sleep's vital role in health is pushing scientists to explore some of the many mysteries of the sleeping brain. Did you dream? I think, I think so. At the Stanford Center for Sleep Sciences, Dr. Emmanuel Mignot is hoping to shed light on common sleep problems by examining a rare disorder, with a little help from man's best friend. Bear is a narcoleptic dog. When he's excited, he has momentary paralysis, which also occurs in people with narcolepsy, a brain disorder that causes people to suddenly fall asleep. We found the cause of narcolepsy by studying the genetic form of narcolepsy in dog and by searching the gene for narcolepsy. <laughs> it was a mutation in the receptor for this chemical called hypocretins. And when we discovered that, we immediately looked in humans if hypocretin was abnormal. It was abnormal, but the cause was different. In human narcolepsy, the culprit is the body's own immune system. In fighting off a childhood infection, the immune system mistakenly attacks the brain cells that make hypocretin. And when they are destroyed, you can't stay awake for a long period of time. A landmark 2013 study from the University of Rochester revealed an important connection between sleep and brain disorders, including Alzheimer's. What they were doing was studying the brain cells of mice when they were awake and when they were asleep. And what they found was that when the mice were asleep, the cells inside of the brain started to physically shrink in their size. In fact, up to 60% reduction was observed in terms of the mass of these cells. The sleeping brain is then able to bathe itself in a cleansing solution of cerebrospinal fluid, which flushes away the toxins that build up while we are awake. If those toxins hang around for too long, not only can they disrupt the activity of our brain cells, but they could also kill our brain cells. One toxic chemical in particular is a protein called beta amyloid. And the reason that protein is important is because we know it may be one of the triggers of Alzheimer's disease. And they found that there were significant reductions, significant removal benefits of that nasty protein by way of sleep. The buildup of brain toxins takes an even greater toll as we age. Our sleep starts to deteriorate. By the time we're 50, non-REM sleep has reduced by 50% relative to when we were 18 years old. We now think that it's not that older people simply need less sleep, it's simply that the brain is unable to generate that deep sleep. For those of us who can't succumb to sleep, are medications a good solution? There's some evidence that it may actually not be naturalistic sleep that those drugs provide. What we actually don't know right now is whether the true electrical activity that happens during that deep sleep is mimicked and enhanced by those drugs. In order to achieve the recommended seven and a half to eight hours of sleep per night, experts suggest sleeping in a quiet, cool room with no bright devices and most importantly, making sleep a priority. We treat sleep like a luxury that we can choose or choose not to engage in. And that's a big problem. So I think it's perhaps time that we wake up, excuse the pun, to the importance of sleep. Does he know the next star already? Um, not yet. We still have one more here. Yeah, no, but he needs to know the next star okay. so he can get going on it. BCD readout complete. It's a little embarrassing how manic we are. These astronomers at the University of California, Berkeley, are connected remotely to the Keck telescope in Hawaii. It's one of the world's largest, and a night of looking at the stars costs $50,000.
Okay, Gary, I've uh, selected the next target. Throughout the night, they communicate with the telescope operator through a video camera and a computer screen. From the time the sun sets till the moment when the sun rises, we don't take any breaks. We just make sure the telescope is pointed at one star and then immediately another star and then immediately another star. Astronomer Jeff Marcy and graduate student Lauren Weiss are using the Keck telescope to search for planets outside our solar system, trillions of miles away. These exoplanets remained elusive for decades. But new technologies and space expeditions changed that. Since 1995, scientists have identified almost 4,000 of these planets, and the manic search continues. It's spectacular. There, wow. there it is. Look at that. Wow, that's There's beautiful. The, it's the inner and then the outer. We're going to be uh, nailing down this outer planet. Yeah, for sure. So this star has two planets an inner planet that takes 10 days to go around the star, it's Jupiter-sized, and we're just now sensing that it has an outer planet that's three times the mass of Jupiter, and we're watching the star wobble around as these planets yank on the star gravitationally. Exoplanets exert a gravitational pull on the stars they orbit, just as Earth pulls on its star, the Sun. Scientists discover exoplanets by measuring a star's light as it's being yanked at by its orbiting planet. The technique that we use to find extrasolar planets is called the Doppler technique. And it makes use of the fact that whenever you measure light waves, if the object is moving toward you, those waves appear to be shortened. As the object is moving away from you, the wave appears to be lengthened. And so we measure these periodic changes in the wavelength and night after night, year after year, we map out changes in velocity. Developing that technique took 12 years and we found no planets at all during that development period, so that was frustrating. And then in 1995, the Doppler method started paying off. A Swiss team, followed by Marcy's own team, started finding the elusive exoplanets by the handfuls. We found many, many Jupiter-sized planets. We then found the first Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus-sized planets. We're seeing the biggest planets, the ones easiest to detect, but I have no doubt that there are smaller planets out there yet to be detected that our current technology simply can't find. Zero and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets in some way like our own. A huge breakthrough in the search for exoplanets happened in 2009 when NASA launched the Kepler telescope into space. The telescope looked for planets in a constellation of our Milky Way galaxy called Cygnus. Kepler used a simple method. It found planets by looking for signs that they were crossing in front of their stars and reducing their brightness. If a dark planet crosses in front of a bright globe, it's going to block a little of the starlight. Kepler has a special mission, to find planets similar in size and temperature to our own. Just how many of these Earth-like planets might be out there came as a shocking revelation in 2013 when Marcy's team presented its estimate. We found in the end that about one out of five sun-like stars has an Earth-sized planet far enough from the star so that it would be suitable for water in liquid form. 40 billion Earth-sized planets at habitable temperatures. This is a really interesting one. Now, the task is to find out how many of these Earth-like planets might actually have water. By watching how hard planets pull at their stars, Marcy and his team can figure out which ones are massive enough to have a rocky surface where water could pool and allow life to develop. The question of other intelligent life in the universe is perhaps our greatest question. And I think most of us have a split brain about the answer. Surely our universe is filled with other species that write poetry, compose music, and ponder their place in the universe. On the other hand, it's very mysterious and a little bit frightening that we have seen no definitive signs of these other advanced civilizations that supposedly are out there. 
maybe advanced technological life poses a threat to itself due to the weapons it develops, the ability to change the global environment. Evidence of smoke palls from the burning oil in the Persian Gulf area. So perhaps those past civilizations that didn't make it are sending a very poignant message telling us to take care of our planet and take care of ourselves. Support for Quest is provided by the National Science Foundation, the David B. Gold Foundation, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Capsonell Foundation, the Vedez Family Foundation, George G. and Jeanette A. Stewart Charitable Trust, and the members of KQED. Quest is a project of KQED Science.